Hello Church, this is part five in our video series asking the question, what is salvation? Where we're looking at what the Bible teaches us about the various benefits and gifts that God has given us through the salvation that he has brought to his people. Um, we've covered a lot of ground so far, uh, looking at these various benefits, and in this video we're looking at sort of a thorny topic. Uh, it doesn't need to be, but it is. Um, and that's the idea of predestination and election. What does it mean that God has uh, chosen people to be saved, to be brought back into his family? Like I mentioned, uh, this is a controversial topic. If you know anything about the debate um, over the centuries of church history, um, many much ink and blood has been spilt um, trying to figure out what exactly is going on uh, with, the, with the doctrine of predestination and election. And we can offer a couple reasons right up front here for why that is. Why is it so hard for us to under, understand this truth? Well, the first is that it's commonly misunderstood and even abused. Um, predestination means, uh, you know, some people might say if they're misunderstanding it, that predestination means that nothing matters, that our choices don't matter, and whoever's going to be saved is going to be saved, and there's nothing that we can do about it. They might say that we don't need to evangelize because, again, it doesn't matter. Whoever is going to be saved is going to be saved. Um, someone might say that, you know, I don't need to, well, if God's going to do whatever he's going to do, then I don't need to study the Bible. I don't need to pray. I don't need to do anything because uh, that got, I don't need to do anything that God commands me to do because I'm either saved or I'm not. And again, there's nothing I can do about it. This is not what the Bible teaches, and I hope in this video uh, we'll see that that's not what the idea of predestination means. It's also hard to understand. Um, how is it that God elects certain people to salvation while people are also responsible for their own actions and choices? How do those two things go together? Um, it's hard for us to understand. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's a mystery, and yet the Bible presents both of those things as true teaches both of those realities as a fact without pitting them against one another, as we often want to do. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility just go together for God, even though they don't always make sense to our finite minds. And that's okay. It doesn't always have to make sense to us, does it? What's important is that it makes sense to God, and it does, and this is the way that God decided to do things. So my goal in this video is to sort of shift our understanding and our approach to this idea of predestination. Uh, that it wouldn't be something that we're afraid of or that we ignore or even that we misunderstand, but that it would be a truth that we can celebrate. Uh, like these other things that we're looking at in these videos, this is a benefit of our salvation. It's true that with any hard doctrine in the Bible, predestination being one of them, that we can either ignore it we can seek to distort it or make it too simple so that we can understand it. Or the third option is that we can bow our knee in submission to Christ to worship him and adore him while trying to understand that thing as best as we can. That's my goal for this video and for this topic of predestination. We're, this side of eternity, we're never going to fully understand what God is doing and how it goes together exactly. All we can do is say, this is what the Bible says, and seek to understand what we can based on what the Bible says. So, what is predestination and what is election? This is uh, sort of the Google definition of predestination, uh, but I think it fits to what the Bible is trying to say as well. Predestination is the divine foreordaining of all that will happen, especially with regard to the salvation of some and not others. Predestination, the word itself, pre means before, destin means to ordain, destiny, so predestiny, that's where predestined comes from, so basically to decide beforehand. And so what predestination means is that God decided beforehand to save people. We've been saying that all along. Uh, we say all the time that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and good, that he is sovereign, that he's the king that he knows everything and he does whatever he wants and he does it for his good and for his glory. We also know that God is present and active in our world. Not only did he create everything, but he's also actively and intimately engaged with the universe that he created. 
So nothing happens apart from his desire or his will or his knowledge of it happening. All of this, everything around us, is his desire and he's surprised by nothing. So in a sense, that's what predestination means. That God is sovereign, that he's in control, and that he has planned all things from before the beginning of time. We're not saying that we're all robots, um, you know, or, or puppets attached to strings. Uh, we don't have, that we don't have personal volitions and that we don't make choices in our lives. We clearly do. You're making a choice to watch this video right now. Yet the Bible also tells us that nothing happens outside of the will and plan of God. Again, I don't know how those things exactly go together. It doesn't always make sense to us, but it makes sense to God. We can affirm these two truths that the Bible teaches. That God is completely sovereign and in control, and that humans are completely responsible for our actions and for our choices. Election, then, is the salvific aspect of God's predestination. To elect something is to choose it. We just had a presidential election, right, where we chose who we want our next leader to be. The gospel benefit of election is that God has chosen people to save, and he worked to save them. Remember, the bad news of the gospel is that all of us, apart from Christ, are unworthy to be saved by God. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are actively enemies of God because we sin against one another and against him. That there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves, and that's why Jesus has to save us. Think of the image of a drowning person. Uh, someone who's drowning can't save themselves even if they wanted to. That's why they're drowning. Someone has to step in and save them. That's what Jesus has done for us. The Bible tells us that we are dead in our sins. Ephesians 2, Colossians 2, elsewhere. The Bible tells us, Romans 5.10, that we are enemies of God and that we hate God naturally. So what did God do? God, in his infinite love and mercy, decided to save a people for himself, to step in and actually save people. He does this all throughout the Bible. Even if you think back to the Old Testament, think about the stories of Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Jacob instead of Esau, Judah, Moses. Think about the message of the Old Testament as God is saving and preserving a group of people at the expense of other people who end up being lost along the way. It's that same reality when we come to the New Testament and this new covenant that Jesus makes with us. God is going to save people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, young and old, men and women, People who could not and cannot save themselves. God is going to save them, and he's going to accomplish the salvation for them through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. People who are dead, spiritually. People who can't do anything. Dead people certainly can't make decisions. It's something we said in a few videos prior. But I believe that the Bible teaches that before Christ, we actually don't have a free will as we often understand it. Not because of God, not because God didn't give us a free will, but because our will is broken because of sin. The Bible tells us that before Christ, we're slaves to sin. Slaves, think about it, don't have a choice. And whether they are free or not, that's why they are slaves. Our minds are darkened and clouded by sin, so in a sense we're unable to will or choose God or do anything freely because we are dead slaves. Think about it like this. We might think of uh, the story of Jesus healing his friend Lazarus as Lazarus is dead, lying in the tomb. Pick up that story in John chapter 11, verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he, heard, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face unwrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. So what decision did Lazarus make to make himself come back to life? Well, nothing, right? He was pretty passive. He was dead in his tomb. Jesus calls to him. Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, and in a sense, breathes life into Lazarus' dead bones, and he walks out of the tomb. That's sort of, I think, how the Bible wants us to think about this, how this metaphoric reality has taken place in the gospel, in our spiritual lives. That we were dead spiritually, we were slaves to sin, yet we hear this message of the gospel, we hear the message of Christ say to our hearts, maybe we've heard it a hundred times before and ignored it, but this one time, something is different. Maybe you hear it for the first time and you believe. But in hearing that good news of the gospel, Jesus makes our hearts and our souls alive. And we respond to that call in faith and repentance, and then we follow Jesus in our lives. There's a sense in which election is a pretty simple idea. God saves people who can't save themselves. He steps in and he saves us. Of course, that reality gets complicated when we start to logically process the reality of that truth, and that's where the controversy lies. Let's look at some biblical support for this truth. I'll say this, the idea that God predestined some to salvation is all throughout the Bible, and there's rarely any explanation on the matter. It's just simply stated as a matter of fact. Let me just we'll go through a couple of quick examples here. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 1, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, here it is, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Paul is saying that the fact that people have believed and have come to faith in Christ shows that God has chosen them and set them apart as those people who would believe. A couple quick ones. John 6, 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent him draws me, and I will raise him up on that last day. What's Jesus telling us there? That no one is saved by accident. That no one comes to the Father, that is, no one comes into this gift of salvation, of union with Christ, unless the Father draws him. That is, calls him, invites him, empowers him. If you think about maybe those times when you heard the gospel message and didn't believe compared to that time when you did believe. There was something different about that time maybe that you believed. Maybe it was where you were in life. Maybe it was how your emotions were working that day or the way you were, your worldview had changed. But perhaps it was, that was God drawing you, orchestrating your life in such a way that you would get to this point where you would hear this message and believe and respond. Jesus says in John 15, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, he may give it to you. We love because he first loved us. Even while we were yet sinners, he died for us. In that same way, we certainly choose Christ, but I think the Bible is clear that we only have the power and the will to choose him once he has chosen us and set his heart upon us and has drawn him to himself. The most well-known passage for this idea comes from Romans 8. This is what we, is known as the golden chain, often, of salvation. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. We see here all of the benefits of our salvation that we've been talking about in this series. It starts with God deciding or predestining grace to save a people for himself. No one will be justified. That is, no one is saved who wasn't first predestined by God to be saved. That's what we've been saying all along, right? That salvation was God's plan from before the beginning of time and that God saves sinners. 
If you flip over in your Bible to Romans 9, Paul really uses that as a foundation for this truth where he starts to dig in a little bit to this mystery of God choosing and God predestining. Uh, about how God chooses not based off of merit or ability, but solely because of his grace and mercy. That starts to bring up some of those logical questions from us, doesn't it? Why did God choose to adopt me into his family? Why am I a Christian, and at least for now, my neighbor is not? Why was I born to parents uh, who valued the church and treasured God's word and taught me the gospel? Why do I have the indescribable privilege of hearing God's truth every Sunday where others do not? We don't really have good answers to those questions, do we? Uh, it's shrouded in mystery. The Bible simply tells us that it pleased God to do so, Ephesians 1.5. And so that's really an opportunity for worship for us right now. If you are a Christian, if you do believe, be thankful that he has, he has saved you and he has uh, he's got you out of the darkness and plead with your neighbor, your unbelieving neighbor, to believe the gospel so that they might be saved as well. One more passage. Again, we could pick many, but I, this passage from Acts has always struck me. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. What we see there is a picture of evangelism, of people preaching the gospel, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. That is, those whom God has chosen to believe, believed. Another metaphor that the Bible uses to, uh, is to liken the word of God, uh, the, the gospel, to seeds that are thrown out indiscriminately. And we preach the gospel to everyone, regardless of who they are or where they came from. Meanwhile, the Bible also tells us that each of those people at, a ver at that various point in their life represents different types of soil, right? They're either thorny or rocky, or some of them are good soil. And the gospel will take root in that good soil and will flourish and grow while it, will, it won't grow in those other types of soils. We don't know who is good soil and who isn't. Only God does. And so we throw out the good news to everyone, knowing and trusting that God is actually going to save some people. Let's get to some complaints about this doctrine or some questions. Number one, is this doctrine unfair? That some people are saved and some aren't? Well, the first is, no one deserves to be saved. Right? If God was being completely fair, uh, then all of us would get what we deserve, which is to go to hell and be punished forever. We deserve death. And so it would be fair to give everyone the death that they deserve. But God, in his grace and mercy, has decided to save a countless multitude uh, that they did not deserve to be saved. Um, he has given them what they didn't deserve, which is eternal life. And so if, you're in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are part of that multitude. If you believe the gospel, if you repent of your sins and trust in Christ, then you're one of those that the Bible calls elect. Does this undermine our free will? Again, uh, uh, it's tricky, right? The Bible says it clearly doesn't. John, here's a couple verses here. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Again, whoever isn't, uh, you know, no one's winking when they write that. And the Bible means whoever believes in Christ will be saved. Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise. If you do these things, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Or even from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 4, 29, but from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all of your soul. It's both of those truths together, all right? God's sovereignty, God predestining and electing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation from all times to be saved, and people making responsible, moral choices. Both of those are happening at the same time. No one makes that choice apart from God desiring for it to happen. And anyone who desires to be saved, who repents of their sins, and trusts in Christ will be saved. Both of those things are absolutely true, even though they don't always go together in our minds. Does this mean we don't have to evangelize? No. Uh, we do have to evangelize. The Bible tells us to. The Great Commission. 
Though God ultimately knows who is going to come to saving faith in Him, we don't know. And the Bible tells us that no one will come to saving faith unless they have heard the gospel. And for someone to hear the gospel, someone has to tell it to them. That's sort of the mechanism of Romans 10, for example. We throw out the message of the gospel indiscriminately, knowing that some will fall on hard, thorny soil and that it will be rejected, but that it will also sometimes land on good soil and that God will use that to bring new life to a person. 1 Timothy 2, 10. Paul says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. That is, Paul goes forth with his missionary zeal, knowing that there are people out there who need to hear the gospel because they'll respond to it and be saved. So really, this truth of predestination and election should bolster our evangelistic efforts because we can trust that there is good soil out there. There are people who will hear the gospel and believe so that we should go and preach the gospel message everywhere. One commentator said it like this, Through evangelism, God allows people to participate in his great plan of drawing a people unto himself from every nation and language on earth. The doctrine of election frees us to share the gospel without pressure or fear or failure. When we share the gospel clearly, we have been obedient, and that is a success. The results are left to God. That is, it's not our job to save people. That's God's job, and it's his pleasure. It's our job to be faithful and to share the message of Christ so that unbelieving ears might hear, believe, and be saved. So, why does this matter? Predestination is the reason that we pray to God that he would save the lost people in our lives that we care about. We pray every night for our two kids, Judah and Eliza, that God would save them because we know that we can't save them, only he can. We know that only God can save sinners, that they can't save themselves. But that truth cuts against our sort of our human, often American desire for freedom and choice. And that's why it's such a hard doctrine for us to understand. We want to be able to do this, but we can't. We need God's help to do it. Here's what Paul writes in Ephesians 1. We saw this last week. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. And then down in verse 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of him, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. This doctrine is good news. It's that God has saved us. That God is meticulously writing the story of history according to his own script. And that God loves sinners. Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, he died for us. And this is for God's ultimate glory, not ours. Mark Dever says that we often get caught up in the number of sinners saved. When really we should be worried about the glory of a God who would save anyone at all. The fact that God would decide to save you, undeserving you, is the miracle here. So why does this matter? Pastor Jeff Robinson, he's with the Gospel Coalition, writes these three things. I just took them from him. Predestination means that our salvation is as secure and settled as the God who selected us. Our salvation isn't based on me or anything that I can do. It's based on God, and he has promised to carry it through. Number two, predestination means our salvation is eternally grounded in a sovereign, good God. Therefore, our sufferings, sorrows, persecutions, and defeats are not an accident. He goes on and says this, Though you may never fully understand it, your hurt is God's instrument in his indefatigable mission of making you into the image of his Son. God's absolute sovereignty wed with his goodness is the best medicine for human anxiety. That is, our God's in control, he's good, and he's looking out for your good if you've trusted in him. Your suffering doesn't make sense now, but when you look back, if you're in Christ, you'll see what he was doing. Finally, he says, predestination should humble us and make us thankful, not bitter, 
fearful, or always spoiling for debate. Here's the truth of God's predestining love according to the Bible. God predestines those who will be saved, and we must choose Christ in order to be saved. Both of those things go together and are equally true according to the Bible. Romans 11.33 proclaims this, O oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom of God, wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. This is a mystery, uh, but it's a wonderful mystery. This is the truth about what God has done. So we've only spent 25 minutes there exploring a topic that has been a debate for centuries and many uh, people much smarter than us have been talking and debating about I encourage you to study this topic further. Uh, we've only begun to scratch the surface here. Many of you who have watched this video might have a different opinion uh, of this truth than I do. And that's okay. I'd encourage you to keep asking questions, to keep exploring, talk about this further, because we all want the same thing, don't we? We all want to better understand God's truth. We all want to better understand the good news of who God is and what he has done for us and what that means in our lives today. We do that by studying, we do that by praying, asking that the Holy Spirit would help us, and we do that by exploring these truths and God's Word in community with one another. That's how we grow and that's how we learn. So I encourage you to keep studying this. Feel free to reach out to me, ask questions, talk to me more about this if you'd like. Uh, I hope this video has been, been edifying and helpful for you, that it encourages you uh, to study this doctrine more. In our next video, we'll look at something a little lighter. Uh, the idea of regeneration, faith, and repentance. Hope, you'll, hope we'll see you then. Thanks.